Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm a third year PhD at the Vienna University of Technology. And I'm super excited to talk to you about efficient and effective dense retrieval. All right, so dense retrieval has the potential to bring neural advances in a meaningful way into production search systems because it allows us to deploy very low latency systems and still improve the effectiveness of our search results greatly. And the problem now becomes that dense retrieval models need help training. So we can train them basically alone as we would train uh, re-ranking models and it kind of works okay. But if we uh, want to have a greater potential and use it to a greater potential, we need to adapt training methods to help dense retrieval models to train better. And various approaches have been proposed in uh, the last year or so, and many of them require more and more hardware resources to conduct the training. We went in a bit of a different direction. Um, we focused on efficient training methods that can be done on modest university hardware. Um, to create an effective dense retrieval model. And we do so in multiple stages. We utilize knowledge distillation from two different teacher models, and we created a sampling strategy for batches called topic aware sampling that compose, composes batches to help the training. All right, let's dive in. The dense retrieval life cycle is basically in three phases. And first, as a foundation, we need to train our model. If we then publish the model on hugging phase, we can skip this step. But then once we have a trained model, we can use it to index every passage or document in our collection in a nearest neighbor index and use that to search. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the first step. But of course, the other two are equally important for a good production system. I'm using uh, the so-called or self so-called BERT dot architecture where you independently encode the query and the passage with a BERT style encoder. And then you take the CLS vector output and use a dot product, hence the name, to create a single relevance score. There are uh, numerous um, different variants. You could use the cosine similarity um, you can use different BERT uh, implementations, etc. But the main thing here is that we move most of our computational uh, requirement into the indexing phase because we can uh, encode every passage offline once. All right, so now how do we train our BERT dot model? We can train it uh, like a re-ranking model with uh, negatively sampled passages, um, and it works okay. So you still get better results than uh, BM25 in most cases, but we can still do better. And considering that we don't actually want to use the model as a re-ranker, but as a first stage retriever, we need to be aware of um, more recall requirements as well as not returning any random results. And the BERT dot architecture gives us two different ways to um, improve that. First, we can reuse encodings um, during our training. And second, we can use the indexing capabilities during training. But the second method is very expensive to do. So we're going to focus on the first one. And the first uh, method I want to talk about here is a sampling strategy called in-batch negatives where if we have a training batch of queries, relevant passages and non-relevant passages, what we could do is we could use a so-called pairwise view where we pair a positive passage and a negative passage each with the query and encode it in the model together. Or we can look at it individually, encode each sequence once and then reuse uh, already encoded vectors to create more uh, signals for the loss function 
to be used if we crisscross um, negative passages inside the batch. Our approach to this uh, is adding knowledge distillation and topic aware sampling um, towards that. So let me uh, take a step back here and briefly talk about the idea of knowledge distillation. So the MS marker data that um, we all uh, use is a great resource of web search data with lots and lots of training queries, but the data is quite noisy and we have uh, many false negatives. So what are we doing? Um, we're using a powerful or multiple powerful teacher models that are already trained on this task to give us um, fine-grained scores for all our training samples. And those fine-grained scores can then be used to better train the student model um, and train it more efficiently to produce better weights that produce higher quality results without actually changing the student architecture at all. And we found that if we want to distill knowledge between different architectures of re-ranking and retrieval models, that different models um, such as Colbert, Bird Dot, uh, a concatenated Bird re-ranker, they all tend to converge to different absolute scoring ranges, which in practice doesn't matter because for the ranking, we only look at the relative differences and the orderings. But if we now want to use the scores to train a model, um, we found it best to optimize the margin between relevant and non-relevant samples and not optimize on the absolute scores themselves. Using this margin optimization, we add an efficient dual supervision approach that uses two different teacher models, um, each for the best possible um, use of its capabilities. So for the pairwise few of our batch, we use a concatenated BERT re-ranker because there we get the best results, but it's quite expensive to run. For the individual view and our in-batch negatives, we use a Colbert teacher because here we can also use um, the individual view and reuse encoded passages. And together, um, we tie it all together with our margin MSE loss. But wait, so we have um, now uh, this great dual supervision approach to fine grained train on in-batch negatives. But if we sample completely random queries in our batch, the in-batch negatives have nothing to do with, it, with each other because the collection is large enough that the likelihood of two queries having something to do with each other in a single batch is very low. So what are we doing is that we use a baseline model to cluster our query representations and create topically related clusters of queries. And here in this example, you can see randomly uh, sampled clusters and queries. And inside a cluster, the queries tend to be quite topically related. But if you now imagine taking in-batch negatives between uh, different clusters that the information for the model is quite low. So our topic aware sampling makes use of that. And instead of randomly sampling queries out of our whole query pool, we randomly sample queries out of a single cluster so that all the queries we use for in-batch negatives have something to do with each other. Additionally, we also observe that if you take the uh, passages, the positive and negative passages associated with a query given by the MS marker training data, that many of those passage pairs are quite distant from each other. And we want to make the pairwise training um, harder. So therefore, we um, subsample um, passages that have a large margin for the pairwise teacher, and we make this pairwise teacher training harder and give more information in the loss function. 
So it turns out that approach works quite well. <laughs> and it um, is, uh, so, or at least two months ago, it was state of the art uh, when we published our paper. Uh, <laughs> so it um, does quite well across different query sets. So we evaluated here um, on the sparse MS Marco uh, labels where we only have one uh, annotated um, passage per query, but also on the track deep learning sets where we have around 200 annotated passages per query. And we can see that uh, the task balance training improves across the board on all, uh, on most metrics, especially considering that we use many more limited resources than other approaches and smaller batch sizes than other approaches. One result I want to especially highlight here is the recall. So dense retrieval models, um, funny enough, as we saw just now as well, have a hard time increasing the recall on the track deep learning track. And the deep learning track is a good um, collection to look at because as I said, we have hundreds of annotated um, passages per query. So the recall numbers are, um, quite good to look at here. And previously, dense retrieval models here in blue and yellow have um, not been able to substantially or even at all outperform BM25. But our task balanced uh, trained dense retriever is the first here in red that substantially and significantly outperforms both BM25 and doc to query and then if we fuse our dense retrieval and talk to query results, we get the top line here that even uh, further improves our recall numbers. Speaking of uh, fusing together dense retrieval results with other methods, we also did that. Um, here we looked at combining dense retrieval and sparse retrieval with talk to query and also at a re-ranker on top. Um, in this case, we look at two different groups of systems, uh, low latency and uh, something we call medium latency systems. And in both cases, if we now combine uh, our dense retrieval model with Dr. Query, we get improved results and um, the state of the art results for those low latency systems. But then because we have improved recall across all uh, cutoffs, we can also add a re-ranking stage and re-rank fewer documents to get better results given our time constraints. And here we used the dual T5 re-ranker only on the top 10 results and still uh, improved our numbers across the board uh, quite well. So now that I've shown you um, overall effectiveness measures, let's dive in a bit into what that actually means and try to find out where dense retrieval breaks and where it doesn't. So dense retrieval models have a novel failure type. And this failure type is retrieving completely random passages that have absolutely no lexical overlap. And we have this failure type because we operate in unconstrained vector space and nothing stops us from, uh, from retrieving any passage. In BM25, for example, this is not possible because we would have to have at least one lexical overlap between a query and a retrieved passage to be it retrieved. So in our analysis, um, we looked at the token overlap between a query and the first retrieved passage. In the first case, we look at an untrained model and we see it completely fails. So if you use dense retrieval and you don't train it, um, naturally it fails. But as soon as we train it here with a standalone or our task balanced approach, we can see that the um, relative number of queries right here um, goes down to a fraction 
of the overall queries. And most, if not all, results have uh, at least one common token overlap. And to find out if those um, passages represent a failure or not, we also went ahead and added um, fine-grained annotations for those first retrieved passages and the query sets we found with the token overlap. And we can see that, yes, um, the delta between a random sample and those passages is a bit uh, lower of P at 1. But overall, the precision at 1 of task balance is still over 60% in this case. Then we also um, want to have a bit of fun <laughs> and um, see if we can retrieve unknown acronyms. And naturally, what we did is we used uh, retrieval conference acronyms. Those, of course, this is a very artificial example. And those acronyms are not in the MS Marco collection, and the queries are also not in the MS Marco collection. But what, what you can see here is that uh, our dance retrieval model never saw those acronyms, but is still able to um, correctly order those three passages um, by the correct uh, conference acronym that we find. Um, even if we misspell one of those, uh, it still uh, retrieves the correct passage, which might be com completely random, of course, but it shows that it is possible to find unknown acronyms that we never saw during training. And finally, we wanted to look at if we can um, find cases where BM25 is actually better um, than our dense retrieval model and where the dense retrieval model has hard and embarrassing failures. And to do that, um, we used, again, the sparse judgments of MS Marco as a filtering mechanism. And we filtered queries where BM25 has the highest score and our dense retrieval model has the lowest possible score. There are not many queries uh, in the large MS Marco dev set on which this uh, condition is true. So for task balance, this is fewer than 1% of all queries where we could find it via sparse judgments, which in itself is not a bad result. But then we went again ahead and added um, our own annotations. And we found that the precision at one, again, is over uh, 60%. And the true failure rate is much smaller than 1%. So our, what, what do we take away from this analysis? Um, we show that a dense retrieval model, um, if it is well-trained, for example, with uh, task balanced, it is good at lexical matching. Um, but this statement, of course, only applies to the MS Marco uh, collection and in domain training and evaluation. And in different domains, it might be different. And on MS Marco, we also have a very hard time finding um, systematic patterns where BM25 can outperform dense retrieval. If you want to. Um, no more. We have a, an open master level course on neural IR, including uh, crash courses on IR and NLP. Our source code is public on GitHub, and many of our models are also publicly available on the Hugging Face Model Hub. And with that, I quickly want to summarize my talk. So dense retrieval is indeed a promising um, direction for the future of search. If we use knowledge distillation from strong teachers, we can help train dense retrieval models a lot and improve their quality by a lot. And margin MSE and task balance are uh, currently among the state of the art methods to train dense retrieval models. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, thank you very much. So now we're opening uh, questions. So do we have any questions? Uh, I will go ahead if, if no one, uh... oh yeah, okay. 
talk. Um, so here's a question. So the BM25, what's great about it is you don't train, right? It's just a straight up algorithm. How far are we towards having these models where we can even train less, right? So getting to something where, yeah, how much, can we reduce the amount of training data we need to get a model that works better than BM25? So at the moment, uh, we are very much um, in need of a lot of training data to get good results. So um, interestingly, if you look at the MS Marco collection and you say you um, keep it in domain, so you train on the same domain that you evaluate, you can actually reduce your training data by a lot, um, something like to 10% of the original training data and still outperform BM25 by large margins, but of course at uh, reduced overall effectiveness. Um, the, uh, I think, um, more interesting question is how to then do out of domain evaluation. And here I think Niels is going to talk more about that. Great. More questions? Okay, I'm going to the back. Hi, have you trained any average expansion, query expansion uh, ex extensions for your like retrieval, like only average query extension or some different algorithms to get uh, more like uh, recall, I think, because uh, most of this you have like good precision, but not as far as good recall or like in comparison with PM25 also. So I, I have not, so I'm, uh, for the recall improvements, um, we only use uh, dense retrieval. And I haven't tried adding um, query expansion, although, uh, to, so doc to query is document expansion, which kind of goes into that direction um, of extending the, the text. But yeah, we only used it for our fusion and not for uh, training it ourselves. Great talk, congratulations. And um, so you have those clusters, right? That are uh, quite essential for the start of training. Uh, and did you try like reducing the number of clusters and what's the impact that you have by reducing the number of clusters? Um, yeah, we, we tried quite a few combinations and very frustratingly, it didn't change anything. So um, the having a cluster and versus having no clusters, there is a clear difference and we have uh, quite a few ablation studies which, uh, which show that, but the number of clusters um, and how many queries you have per cluster, there the method is uh, quite robust against any changes and you get roughly the same results um, minus uh, usual noise. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, actually, I have two questions, but they're kind of related. So the first one is um, the, the dense representation of the model. Uh, is that depends on the, uh, the docs you have, the collection? Um, yeah, so uh, the, of course, the, um, the representation depends on, on your input. Um, but you can, the training itself, so that the model can be applied to other domains and other documents it has not seen during training, if, if that was your question. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, actually, uh, that uh, comes to my second question. So uh, for, for instance, if I want to use dense retrieval in a product and I have to index the documents I have, so, uh, can you maybe elaborate on this part? How to index those documents? Um, yeah, so uh, you can uh, go ahead and, and check out the link. I think the, the slides will be available afterwards. Um, so there on, um, so we have our trained models on hugging phase. So you can just uh, take the model checkpoint that is there, download it, and then 
use our source code, which is the, the matchmaker library. And we have a, a hopefully clear uh, getting started guide on there as well, how you can um, use uh, this already trained model on your own documents. So you just need to put your documents into the uh, right format and then the library can read them, um, encode them, index them, and also provide you with uh, ways to search and evaluate on uh, data if you have any. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.